All right. Uh, so hi, I'm Jeff from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I do a few Drupal modules. A um, few of them are up there, a couple of which I'll be mentioning today, well, one I'm talking about today. Uh, if you want to find me online, I'm on Drupal.org as Gapple, or uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. Uh, I, work out, I work at MyPlanet, which is from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, it's a pretty cool place. Uh, talking about headers today, uh, I figured I'd start with a couple simple ones. Uh, this one is X content type options. And since it starts with an X, it's actually not a standard header. Um, but this addresses an issue in the past of web browsers try to be pretty lenient in the content they accept. So if you write a script element on your page and link it to something that's not JavaScript, uh, the browser actually try and still execute it, which might not be a good thing if it's not JavaScript. It might not be something that's supposed to execute. Uh, but the browser is going to try and do that and trust it anyways. Uh, and this is one that uh, Drupal actually handles for you by default. Uh, it sets a value to no sniff, which tells the browser to say, hey, if you get a script element or you get a style element that's supposed to link to a style sheet, and the server doesn't tell you that that's actually the content you accept, don't run it. And that protects you from a few, uh, few different options, a few different things. So like I said, Drupal helps you out by default, makes sure that, they, that you're kind of uh, doing a safe thing. And I think browsers are actually trying to pull back this behavior so that this header won't be needed in the future. But it's safe to start with. Um, another one that, that Drupal gives you by default is frame options. The risk here is something called a click jacking attack, where if another site puts your website in an iframe, the user sees your website and can try and interact with it, but they can potentially be interacting with an invisible layer on top. Um, so this could be fairly innocuous if they're trying to click a button on your website, think they're doing one thing, and the website that wraps your page is actually doing something else. Or it could be something like they think they're typing in their username and password, and that allows them to steal credentials. So there's a few options to kind of restrict this. Uh, the default that Drupal goes with is same origin to say your site is the only site that's allowed to have itself in an iframe. Uh, you can be more strict. Um, you know, in a lot of cases today, you don't use or don't need iframes. And you can say outright, my page should never be in an iframe. Uh, but there is other options. In some cases, you actually are providing an iframe that should be accessible to other locations. And you can target that to say, this is the only website that should be able to include my site in an iframe. And this is, can be done per page. So if you're providing a service to another website um, or to like different service providers, you can say each one is only allowed to iframe their own specific page. So Drupal sets this by default to same origin. Um, but when it sets it, it does it so that it's overridable. Um, so if you want to make this more strict or not, um, it lets you do that. Uh, another browser feature is uh, cross-site scripting protection. Uh, this is built into Chrome, Safari, Safari, and Internet Explorer. Uh, Firefox doesn't do this, but it has a couple heuristics to detect, you know, is there a potential cross-site scripting attack on this website? So the default is one, where it goes, okay, if I think that something might be running that's bad, I'm just not going to execute that portion of code. Um, that can co potentially cause a few problems, though. Um, maybe it's actually blocking something legitimate. Or the other challenge is it's silently blocking it by default. So if something's not executing, you or the user might not be aware of it, but it could actually break some functionality on your website. So a lot of cases recommend that you go to the stricter mode uh, with mode block. And that means that if the kind of the browser heur heuristic detects that, hey, something weird is going on here, it actually blocks the entire page, which makes it a lot more obvious that something is going wrong and you need to fix it. You might not necessarily be aware of that, though, is the problem. So Chrome adds another option where you can actually send uh, kind of a log of, hey, this browser blocked something. Send it to the server, and the server will have a record of, like, hey, content is getting blocked. You probably need to look at this page, whether it's something just you know, injected innocuous, you need to clean up the page, or the browser um, is detecting something that shouldn't and you need to make a larger change. Um, refer policy is a little bit different because it's more about the information that you share. Um, whenever you link between pages on the website, each request says, hey, what 
sent me here in a referrer header. And that also includes if it's a linked request like an image or you're calling out to a content delivery network for your styles or your scripts. Each of those are gonna be able to tell what pages on your website are sending information. And if your URL contains something that maybe should be private, you might wanna restrict where that gets sent. You know, do you want your CDN to know how many users and what their usernames are on their website because their user profiles are linking to you know, this style sheet that's somewhere else. So this header gives you a few options uh, from the completely restrictive no refer to say never send a refer header at all to the like most permissive of unsafe URL of anytime you're sending a request if it has a refer that is my site, send the full information and various ones in the middle. Uh, the default, if you don't set it, is basically equivalent to no refer when downgrade, so that if you're going from a secure web page to an unsecure web page, no refer is sent, but as long as you're going from unsecure to unsecure or secure to another secure web page, then it'll include that header. Um, one of the ones that I think is most interesting example is strict origin when, when cross origin, so that if you're going within your own website, it sends all of the information. Page two knows that it was sent from page one, but if you're linking off-site, it hides that path. So if you link to Google or anywhere else on the website, they know that your website sent a request to them, but they don't know which page it is. Uh, and then because it's strict, uh, there's the two options, strict or not. The strict one says that it has to be done over the same protocol as well. So if you're linking from a secure page to an unsecure page, it goes, I don't want to expose this information over an unsecure connection, and it completely excludes it. Um, to implement any of these headers, the best case is probably you want to do it within Drupal itself, since the request is in Drupal 8 is now the responsibility, uh, kind of the symphony components. Um, you have to use an event subscriber as opposed to a hook. Uh, but they're fairly easy to implement. Uh, first, you just register it as a service. The important part here is tagging it as an event subscriber so that, it, so that Drupal knows I have to ask this when I need to act or when I'm doing certain things. You can pass it arguments, and here I have the example of you're passing it just general site configuration to make some decisions. Um, but any Drupal service can be included here to give it information. And then the actual class is, is Pretty simple as well. You're implementing the event subscriber inf interface, which you can see from the use statement is from Symphony component. You're telling it, I want to act whenever Drupal is sending a response, and then I want to run a particular method. In this case, all it's doing is adding a header, uh, and this is strictly setting that header. It'll overwrite any previously one. So for example, Drupal setting the frame options header, this is the way that you can say, I want to have the most strict frame options header, and Drupal core will respect that, won't overwrite it. Um, so one of the other big things that's happening is the internet in general is moving to kind of a secure by default policy. You know, users should be able to have the assumption that their information between their browser and the website that they're looking at is private. No one else can listen to it or, or intercept it. Uh, Chrome and Firefox are being most strict about this, Chrome especially. Uh, right now, if you go to a website that doesn't have a secure certificate and try and type in a password, they give you a warning to say, hey, this is information you probably don't want to share to anyone in between. Um, and you should probably be concerned that anyone can listen in. If you're typing this in in a coffee shop, someone might be aware of what your password is and could then access your account. And they're bumping this up. Next month, Chrome is actually gonna give a warning on any form input on your website. So if you just have a search, users should be able to expect that no one can listen in to what they're searching on your website. And so Chrome will pop up a warning uh, as well within Drupal if you have a view with an exposed filter. That's a form input. It sends, you know, it sends additional information back to the browser, and people probably don't want that able to be listened on, into and exposed. Uh, so there's a couple options uh, you know, for securing a website. Let's Encrypt is a free automated service that provides domain validated certificates. Uh, so if you have control over your server, if you run it on a VPS, for example, they provide a command line script and uh, cron tools that will perpetually keep your uh, certificate up to date. Um, 
a lot of services are starting to integrate it. Pantheon is one where you can get a free certificate just by clicking a button and turning it on into inter their interface. Uh, and some hosts like DreamHost, uh, which is a shared hosting provider integrated as well, hopefully more in the future. Um, or Cloudflare is a service that can wrap your website and they provide free certificates as well. So where strict transport security comes in is that when someone first goes to your website, they just type in your domain. They have no idea whether it's unsecured or secured and you can do a redirect, but that first request to the website is always sent unsecured because the browser by default puts HTTP at the front and that's it. They get the redirect to the secure connection and then their browsing session is fine. But when they go to the website again, they type in the domain name, the browser adds it without the S at the beginning, and they're sending another unsecure request. So the strict transport security is a way for you to add a header that says, if you ever come back to this website, expect that it will have a secure certificate and don't make any requests that aren't secure. And then in addition, if there's a problem with the certificate, um, if you don't use something like Let's Encrypt that automatically renews it for you and it expires, the browser goes, hey, something really big is probably wrong. And you can't just go, hey, I want to skip this warning. Um, because the browser knows this is probably something that shouldn't just be skipped. Uh, it's pretty easy to set. Um, my recommendation, if possible, um, so like on my own servers, I run this. I put this directly in the virtual host configuration right alongside where I set the certificates. Um, if that's not an option for you, depending on your host, you can also set this in uh, your HD access files or directly in Drupal itself. I just like to put it next to the certificate because they are, they are related. Um, and then I get to the big one, is content security policy. Uh, one of the most common security vulnerabilities on the web is cross-site scripting, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it can be pretty innocuous. The basic test of it is, can you put in just an inline alert onto your page? And does it pop up a message? You know, this doesn't risk much, but you still don't want to allow this. Um, if an administrator is on your website that has some inline JavaScript, that JavaScript can act as that administrative user is, or similar to the clickjacking attack, if any user goes to the website and there's inline JavaScript that was put there maliciously on your login page, someone can extract credentials um, from those users, learn their passwords, get access to your site, or if they reuse that password, get access to more from that user, log into their email and other things. So content security policy gives you the option to say, I don't want to allow that. Uh, this is a screenshot of the browser console that's saying this browser knows that I shouldn't be able to run inline JavaScript so that it just skips over it and, and gives a warning to say, hey, there was invalid JavaScript on this page. I'm not running it. Uh, it's a little bit more expansive than that. There's actually quite a few options. Uh, in the case of the previous example, it's script source where you can say, hey, I only want to allow JavaScript from a certain location to be able to run. You can include that for CSS, which also has some, some attacks that are possible. You can restrict images to say, well, I only want to allow images from my own domain. Like I believe Drupal.org does this, um, where it doesn't allow links to external images. Uh, Connect Source actually uh, deals with APIs. So if your site connects, makes an HTTP request to an external service, you can restrict where a browser is able to send any information or make any requests. And frame source is basically the standardization of that uh, earlier frame header, where you can say what sites are allowed to put my site in a web frame, and then there's also a child source one that says what sites are allowed to be in an iframe on my own website. So there's a bunch of different options here to give very specific ones, and then there's kind of a generic wrapper around it that is a uh, default source. To say, by default, I only want things to be valid if they come from my own website. Uh, it also allows a few other options that are pretty helpful. Upgrade insecure requests. Um, it's less common today, but in the past there was mixed content warnings. If your secure website linked to an image on an unsecure domain, the browser would go, hey, something's weird about this, there's a bit of a warning. 
Um, in the past, you could opt in to allow those or not. Some browsers blocked them. Upgrade in security requests says to the browser, I want everything to go over to a secure connection. So automatically change it to an HTTPS request, even if it's HTTP. And that applies whether it's a link to your own domain or any other domain. Um, there's the option that there's the possibility that that can break things if it's linking to another site that doesn't enable security. Um, but at the very least, it does ensure that everything goes over a secure connection. And then the last one uh, that I've got up there is report URI. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned before with the XSS protection is what if something is blocked? How are you going to potentially be aware of it? Report URI tells the browser that if anything is blocked, it should actually notify you uh, by sending a, a JSON object to a location on your website so that you can actually log and process those to know whether you know, someone is trying to inject anything on your website or alternately if just something is misconfigured and you're blocking something that you do actually want to allow. There's a few uh, keywords that you can apply. Um, you can outright block things. So for example, if you don't want to allow JavaScript at all in your website, you can add this header and say, I want no JavaScript at all. Um, some of the other ones, you know, maybe that's more appropriate for iframes to say, I don't want to allow my site in an iframe or I don't want any iframes included on my website so that, you know, content editors can't, can't add anything. Uh, self goes to the same domain. Um, so you're saying, I want to allow JavaScript as long as it comes from the same domain as the page itself. Uh, the star is basically an everything is allowed. Um, so any domain uh, is allowed. But the one restriction is that doesn't include inline scripts. So if someone was able to add some sort of random JavaScript into a text box on your website, even if it's inserted, that's going to be blocked even if um, external requests to any content delivery network are allowed. So you have to specifically opt in to say, you know, I want to inla la allow inline JavaScript or style sheets, or um, I'm going to leave that off and they'll be blocked by default. And then the other one is uh, eval for, especially for JavaScript, where it's um, kind of dynamically created code in JavaScript itself. So that's something that, you know, is maybe less used today, um, but gives you a little bit of protection about certain uh, kind of JavaScript attacks, just even if you're limiting to allow inline script as well. Uh, you can specify domains. Uh, so for example, if you're linking to a particular content delivery network for external JavaScript uh, on your website or linking to certain locations for um, you know, style sheets and images, uh, you can use wild code cards for subdomains. So if you have a network of sites, you don't have to list every single domain in it. You can just list your, um, your main domain with a, a wild card. And then you can actually limit protocols as well. So uh, this would be less important if you were using that upgrade insecure requests uh, property. But in here, you can say, I only want to allow connections to a website if they go over a, a encrypted connection, or I just want to allow requests in general with just the protocol and the colon to say that they have to come from a secure connection. This obviously can get a little long. Uh, this example is from DrupalReleaseDate.com. Um, which I built before I understood this header. So it has to allow unsafe online still because I didn't refactor that out. It needs to include the uh, content delivery networks to load uh, jQuery, Bootstrap, um, a Google API to be able to connect to Google Analytics. Um, but it doesn't always have to be that complicated. Um, and then again, this header is only set on your HTML pages as well, so not every request is going to have to send this additional information. And then hopefully with HTTP2, your browser can reuse connections, and it's actually only setting this header once, and then on subsequent requests, it's saying, hey, I just want to send this header again, and it's actually only like a single, single byte each time. Um, as I mentioned with a report URI, there is a risk that you're going to block something that you don't want to, um, so there is a report-only version of the header. So we can start out with a very lenient one to say, I want to allow JavaScript link to anywhere. Um, I'm going to allow inline because I know I have some stuff, but I'm trying to get rid of it. Do a report if anything is actually blocked, and then you can have a more restrictive one that's in report-only mode. So in this case, I'm going to restrict it to self, and then any time the web page loads, it's going to apply the lenient restrictions 
and then report on the less lenient restrictions. So if anything else comes up, it's going to give you a report, but not actually block it from executing so that it doesn't affect the, the user or the functionality of your website. And then one of the cool things that I think that you can do with this is that you can actually start to segment your things. So for example, in a Drupal website, your files directory both has your aggregate files and user uploaded files. And you don't want your user uploaded files to include a JavaScript file that can be included on your website, because that's essentially a cross-site scripting attack as well. So you can actually start to separate it out to say, I have specific domains with vetted JavaScript, vetted style sheets, and I only want to allow those to execute from a particular domain. And as well, I've got an example here, if I only want to allow files or images to be linked if they load directly from you know, core or a module, or they're a user uploaded file. I don't want anything off my website. Um, so integrating with this with Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 does a couple important things. One is that core doesn't do any inline JavaScript itself. Um, previously in Drupal 7, the Drupal settings was added through an inline function. Uh, that's actually changed in Drupal 8, so it isn't. So out of the box with Drupal, you can do a default source self. Um, and it won't block things, won't restrict things. And then the other component is that everything is added through a library's definition. So when you're building your module, it has to pre-specify these are all of the JavaScript and CSS files that I'm going to load onto my website, which allows to make an automated policy to say, I know beforehand everything that should be valid on my website, um, restrict it to only those things. Uh, so since I'm, I'm giving a presentation on it, I figured I have to actually build this. Uh, so I have an alpha version of the module that applies a report, all only header, a report only header and actually does do that, pull it in from libraries, um, which is a great start. Uh, unfortunately, parts of the web don't like this. Uh, Google Analytics is one example. This is their recommended JavaScript and they tell you to just paste this into the head of your website. And then the other problem is like you can wrap this in Drupal, add it into a local file, that's fine but it dynamically loads its own separate JavaScript file. And the library system has no way of knowing that this exists. Thankfully, in this case, they actually do provide you an alternative. You can wrap the inline script here into something local to, to Drupal, and then you can include the file within JavaScript. The first version really only exists to support Internet Explorer 9 and previous, um, which aren't supported anymore, so hopefully, more services move to this structure where they provide um, kind of snippets and direct links um, to be able to, you know, create content security policies uh, for websites to make them secure. Um, this is one of the reasons why I decided it was a good idea to rewrite one of the top 25 Drupal modules uh, to make a version that actually does work with content security policy um, that does define use that second submit, define it in, in the libraries so that you could turn on an automated uh, content security policy module and not have to worry about your analytics just breaking. Um, it does have some things that are probably important to continue on uh, and finish. Right now, it doesn't have any, any way to handle that logging. It doesn't expose whether um, you know, its automated pro um, policy is failing in any means. Uh, the other problem is that it only works for script and styles. So. Um, hopefully, like, it needs an API so that other modules can say, like, I need to be able to load an iframe. I need to be able to connect to an external service. Don't block me from being able to do this. And then the last one is manual configuration for things like the image sources. Um, the module is never going to be able to make a decision of, does the administrator of this website want to be able to link to external images or not? Um, so that's something that's going to have to be a configurable option in the interface, and I just haven't had the time to, to do that yet. Um, so I know I, I ran through a lot of things quickly. Uh, you can see my presentation online. It does have a bunch of resources for kind of each of the sections that I went over, uh, links to where you can find out the headers and some articles uh, to learn more about them, as well as some extra slides that I had to cut out. Um, contribution sprints are tomorrow. And uh, I would love to, uh, to hear what you think about my session. Uh, so if you have any feedback, please go to, to the uh, event website and uh, let me know what you think, uh, as well as for DrupalCon itself. Thank you.
I think I have probably a minute for questions, but uh, I know I'm running late here and I don't want to eat into the next presentation's time. Hi. A while back it was reported that um, opening a new window of new tab um, gives the new window or tab a um, partial access to uh, the DOM of the previous page. So it can replace, for instance, the uh, location. Um, are there any things right now available to combat that, or would you just push the no opener into the link in the HTML? Uh, so yeah, there is the no opener H property on HTML links, and that's part of content security policy itself, so that you can actually specify through the policy that the page should disown any openers as well. Right. So that works from the header, and you don't have to put it in the HTML anymore on the href, right? Yeah, because uh, if you're linking to another page and you want to exclude the opener, it's the responsibility of the linking page, whereas content security policy allows to move that responsibility to the target page to be able to restrict that. Thanks. So there's definitely a whole lot more options in content security policy. Um, not all of them are available yet. It's actually on its third version. Um, CSP2 is largely implemented in Chrome and Firefox, uh, but there's additional options that are going to be enabled in the future to restrict more things like that as well. Yeah, so basically for still supporting IE11, you will still have to put it in the href probably. Yeah, that would be an example of uh, Internet Explorer 11 and potentially Edge, but hopefully Edge gets updated in the same manner. Okay. Thank you.